Today we are looking at a case from the late 19th century. So sit back as we go to England. Catherine Flanagan was born in Ireland in 1829. Not much is known of her childhood, but she did have at least one sister named Margaret, who was born 14 years later in 1843. When Catherine was still a young girl, her parents left Ireland and came to live in England, settling in Liverpool. In the 1840s, thousands of people arrived in Liverpool from Ireland due to the terrible famine that happened between 1845 and 1849. It was believed that in 1847, around 300,000 people arrived, and by 1851, 25% of Liverpool was Irish-born, and Liverpool was a good place to settle. It was regarded as one of the world's great maritime ports, and at the beginning of the 19th century, it was estimated that up to 40% of global trade passed through the docks. Catherine lived in a poor area, and she was aware that many people who lived close by liked to drink alcohol. Water had to be collected in a bucket from a water pump and brought back to the house. This could be a problem, especially if there wasn't a pump nearby. These pumps could also be a place where diseases spread, so many of the poorer in the community preferred to drink beer and spirits. Gin was a favourite, as it was especially cheap. With this in mind, Catherine decided to open a beer house. In 1830, Parliament had passed the Beer House Act, which liberalised the regulations governing brewing and the sale of beer. This allowed any ratepayer to brew and sell beer on payment of a licence. The intention of the Act was to increase competition between brewers, lower prices and encourage people to drink beer instead of strong spirits. It resulted in the opening of thousands of new public houses and small breweries throughout the country. Catherine took advantage of this and opened a beer house near Liverpool docks. It was a very good location to set up such an establishment, as workers would often pop in after a shift. However, Catherine Flanagan's beer house became known to the local constabulary, as it was often frequented by criminals and prostitutes. She also opened on Sundays, which was not permitted. The government was becoming increasingly more concerned over the law and order in the beer houses, so the excise fee was raised to three guineas and property qualifications were introduced. But it was not until the Wine and Beer House Act of 1869 came into force, which gave control of the licensing of the beer houses to the local justices, that many establishments started to close, including the beer house, ran by Miss Flanagan. Catherine had a reputation for being somewhat careful with what she spent, but now the beer house had closed. She needed to generate an income, so she set herself up as a moneylender. This was often a very lucrative business in Victorian Britain, due to the poor economic conditions of the working class. They suffered from low wages and often irregular incomes. There was also no restriction on money lending, which meant that the money lenders were able to legitimately charge high interest rates. Although it was not considered a respectable occupation, it was one that was easy for Catherine to start. She would borrow money from local loan offices and then lend small amounts to her neighbours, whose circumstances were such that they were unable to borrow money elsewhere. She would only lend a little at a time, and only to people she knew, but the interest rate she charged made her business quite profitable. Around 1880, Catherine opened a lodging house at 5 Skirving Street in Liverpool. She employed her sister Margaret to help her run it. Skirving Street was one of the places occupied by the poor of the city, and although the housing conditions in many areas were starting to improve, the 19th century had seen a large increase in the number of people migrating to the industrial cities. This meant that families often lived in terrible conditions, and it was not unusual to find a family crammed into one room. Life was very difficult for the poor, many of whom worked long hours in factories for very low wages. At the time, industry was going through a difficult period, as despite Britain being a leading economic power, the country was suffering from the effects of the Long Depression, which had began in 1873. Businesses were affected by lengthy periods of low and falling profits, as well as price deflation. Liverpool officially became a city in 1880, by which time the population had grown to more than 600,000. With the problems in the economy, there was an increased demand for cheap accommodation. Catherine and Margaret, along with Catherine's 22-year-old son named John, started the lodging house. It was easy for the sisters to find suitable tenants, and by the winter of the same year, their lodging house was full. 
One room was occupied by a gentleman named Thomas Higgins and his daughter named Mary. The other room was occupied by a gentleman named Patrick Jennings, along with his daughter named Maggie. Despite the poor living conditions offered, the lodging house meant that the sisters were able to live a modest life. Catherine's son John was 22 years old and seemed like a fit young man, even though his mother would tell anyone that inquired that he was in poor health. Nevertheless, it was a surprise to many when the young man died suddenly in December 1880. Following the death of her son, Catherine was paid £71, as John had been registered with the burial society. Although no one had ever seen him unwell, there was no reason to believe that his demise was due to anything untoward. In 1882, Margaret Flanagan and Thomas Higgins started a relationship. They married in the same year, but within just a few months of the wedding, Thomas's eight-year-old daughter named Mary became ill and died. Just like Catherine had done following the death of her son two years earlier, her sister Margaret was able to collect a payment from the burial society. This time, the amount totaled £22. It was quite common for the poor to pay to be members of a burial society, as they did not want a loved one to receive a pauper's funeral. Just a couple of months later, in January 1883, Maggie Jennings, the daughter of Mr Patrick Jennings, the other tenant at the lodging house, also died. She was 19 years old, and although her death was unexpected, the impoverished conditions that many people experienced in Victorian Britain meant that the sudden death of a seemingly healthy person was not uncommon, as well as poor housing and sanitation, which often resulted in outbreaks of typhoid. The harsh working environment following the Industrial Revolution had brought many unwanted diseases. Medical professionals had reported seeing an increase in various lung conditions, many caused by breathing dust and fine particles produced in factories. The life of Maggie Jennings was also insured through the burial society, and the money received following her death was collected by Catherine. Now three people had died in the small lodging house, and it had not gone unnoticed by the residents of Skirving Street. In fact, it was becoming the main topic of conversation. Although they too had all witnessed death and hardship, a child and two seemingly healthy young adults dying in one house, did seem strange. Not wanting to be the subject of local gossip, the sisters moved their establishments, first to 105 Latimer Street, and then to 27 Ascot Street, but death would follow them. In September 1883, Margaret's husband Thomas Higgins became ill. He was 45 years old and a hard-working man who brought money into the household. A doctor named Dr Whitford was called, and he concluded that the mysterious illness was nothing more than dysentery caused by drinking cheap whiskey. He told the patient to stop drinking and prescribed a mixture of opium and castor oil. His wife Margaret stayed by his side, but just two days later, on the 22nd of October 1883, Thomas Higgins died. Dr Whitford concluded that the cause of death was dysentery. However, Thomas Higgins' brother Patrick was surprised to hear that Thomas had died. He knew that his brother had enjoyed good health throughout his life and his sudden death seemed very strange. Thomas had previously told Patrick that a doctor had come to the house with an insurance agent as Catherine and Margaret had wanted to take a life insurance policy out against him for the value of £50. As £50 was such a large amount, it was usual for a doctor to first examine the person whose life was to be insured. Thomas, however, had refused to cooperate. Patrick decided to investigate his brother's mysterious death and soon discovered that Thomas had been insured with five different burial societies from which his wife Margaret was paid a total of £108. Thinking something was not quite right, he contacted the police. The police agreed to investigate, and on the day of the funeral, a police constable, a coroner's officer, and two doctors were sent to 27 Ascot Street. When they arrived, there were people in the small front room around the coffin. Some were drinking, and the constable noted that there was little evidence that anyone was grieving the loss of poor Thomas Higgins. The coroner informed Margaret, that the funeral would not be going ahead as a post-mortem needed to be conducted. Catherine Flanagan said nothing and quickly left the house through the back door. When the autopsy was completed, it was found that high levels of arsenic were present in the body of Mr Higgins. The coroner stated that evidence suggested that due to the amount of arsenic found, it could be concluded that the deceased had been poisoned over a period of several days. When the police searched 27 Ascot Street, they found a bottle containing a mysterious white substance, 
which was later confirmed to be arsenic. The presence of arsenic was also found in the pocket of a coat worn by the deceased man's widow, Margaret Higgins. She was then arrested. Meanwhile, Catherine was hiding from the authorities. She moved from one boarding house to another. Strangely, however, she made no attempt to leave the city. After a week of trying to avoid detection, she was seen and subsequently arrested. On the 16th of October, 1883, the sisters, Catherine Flanagan and Margaret Higgins, were formally charged with the murder of Mr. Thomas Higgins. There were, however, three other people who had died while living in the lodging house, and the magistrate granted permission for the authorities to exhume the bodies of Maggie Jennings, Catherine's son John, and eight-year-old Mary Higgins. John's body was found to be in a good state, with large amounts of arsenic present in it. The same was found with the bodies of Maggie Jennings and little Mary Higgins. All three had died from arsenic poisoning, and their lives had been insured through the burial society. Now armed with the evidence that Thomas Higgins, his daughter Mary, Catherine's son John and Maggie Jennings had all died by poisoning, the detectives presented their findings to the sisters. While Margaret became quite evasive, Catherine told the police that it was her sister that had been the instigator of the crimes. The investigators, however, were unsure how the pair had been able to obtain the poison. They had assumed that they had used rat poison, but when the common adulterants used in rat poison failed to show up at the autopsies. The detectives were quite baffled. Both Catherine and Margaret were illiterate and their names had not appeared in the poison registers of any local chemists. When the detectives asked Catherine, she told the officers that Margaret had extracted the poison from flypapers. She added that she would be willing to be a prosecution witness against her sister, an interesting offer, but one that the Crown decided not to accept. The trial of the sisters, Catherine Flanagan and Margaret Higgins, began at Liverpool St George's Hall on Thursday the 14th of February 1884, before Mr Justice Butt, and lasted for three days. The case for the murder of Thomas Higgins was heard first, and the evidence against the defendants was convincing. When the trial ended, it took the jury just 50 minutes to find them both guilty, and the judge sentenced them to death. On hearing the verdict, Margaret collapsed in the dock. As they had been given the most severe punishment available, the Crown did not proceed with the case against them for the murders of John Flanagan, Maggie Jennings and Mary Higgins. The sisters were then sent back to the Kirkdale prison to await their fate. They were held in separate cells and were attended by the prison chaplain. As they were both illiterates, the prison guards read to them. In the hope that she may have her sentence commuted, Catherine spoke to detectives and gave them the names of other women who she said were responsible for other poisonings in the area. While her statement was taken seriously and the police did investigate her claims, they were unable to obtain sufficient evidence to substantiate them. The prosecuting solicitor for Liverpool, a gentleman named William Marks, then wrote to the director of public prosecutions, informing him that he believed that there were probably more victims who had died by poisoning, but it would be very difficult to prove who other than Catherine Flanagan and Margaret Higgins, could have been responsible for these deaths. Following this decision, there would be no reprieve for Catherine, and at 8am on Monday the 3rd of March 1884, on a very cold and snowy morning, 55-year-old Catherine Flanagan and her sister, 41-year-old Margaret Higgins, were hanged. In spite of the bad weather, a large crowd had gathered outside to see the black flag raised. Since 1868, the public had not been allowed inside a prison to witness capital punishment being carried out. The police continued to investigate Catherine's claims. She had alleged that other women had been involved in poisoning people in order to obtain insurance payments, and she had given the names of Margaret Evans and Bridget Begley. She also said that Margaret Potter, Bridget Stanton and Mrs Fallon worked as agents for the Burial Society, and there was another accomplice named Catherine Ryan. Although it was discovered that Mrs Stanton did have close links to the insurance payouts of some people who had died, charges were never brought against her or any of the other ladies named in Catherine Flanagan's statement. Hello everyone, and thank you so much for listening. As usual, please leave any comments or feedback you may have, and I hope to see you all again in the next brief case